our next speaker is uh, John Chodes from New York City, and he will discuss Lincoln's Civil War against New York City. And uh, if those of you have seen the movie Gangs of New York by Martin Scorsese, uh, you'll hear about the real gangs of New York from John Chodes, who's been researching uh, uh, what the events in his hometown, New York City, during, during the war. And uh, he's an author, writer, and playwright who has also published 20 articles related to the uh, war between the states and reconstruction, several monographs, one of them's on the Union League, uh, which was sort of the propaganda arm of the Republican Party during and after the war. And uh, he has produced eight off-Broadway plays in New York. And I was all, I'm also told that he once finished 52nd in the Boston Marathon. And uh, I used to tell people I once caught a 30-inch rainbow trout as part of my resume. But that's sort of sort of the equivalent. But uh, John Chodes. Carrying on what Tom was saying, in the recent movie, hit movie, Gangs in New York, there's a um, there's a sequence about the so-called draft riot of 1863. The director of the film, Martin Scorsese, when asked on television how close to the truth was this segment, candidly said, think of it as an opera. Um, and I agree. So to correct the record, I'd like to give a more realistic version of that moment in history and it's called Abraham Lincoln's Civil War Against New York. Uh, between 1861 and 1865, there were two wars being fought simultaneously in the United States by Abraham Lincoln and his Republican administration. The first was to prevent the independence of the seceded southern states. The second was a civil war in the North. Upon the six states controlled by the Democratic Party, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. The Union Army was called upon to crush out their guerrilla war, their insurrectionary acts, and full-scale military defiance. This opposition was provoked by Lincoln's attempt to ensure loyalty through terror, arbitrary arrests of civilians, martial law and military trial for citizens hundreds of miles outside the war zone, confiscation of property of suspected traitors, and the closing of anti-Republican periodicals. 38,000 Northerners were arrested and taken to unknown places of confinement without benefit of a writ of habeas corpus or a trial by jury. Fernando Wood, the former mayor of New York City, summed up the reality of what provoked the North to rise. He said, the United States was in the midst of two revolutions, quote, one at the South with the sword and the other at the North by executive and legislative usurpation. Taking advantage of the popular enthusiasm in behalf of the Union, it has, under the pretext of furthering this holy object, gradually fastened the chains of slavery upon the people." Unquote. The Democratic Party was devoted to peace and reconciliation with the Confederacy. Its platform, like the South's, defended state sovereignty by thwarting the powerful, centralized national government adopted by the Republicans. Horatio Seymour, New York's Democratic governor, before and during the war, spoke about the Southerners being heroic and loyal to the Union in the past as a way to end the sectional conflict. Quote, upon whom are we to wage war? Our own countrymen whose courage has never been questioned in any contest to which we have been engaged. They battled by our side with equal vigor in the revolutionary struggle. 
in the last war with Great Britain, which was the War of 1812, and in the Mexican conflict. Virginia sent her sons under the command of Washington to the relief of beleaguered Boston. Alone, the South defeated the last and most desperate efforts of British power to divide our country at the Battle of New Orleans." Unquote. Horatio Seymour tried to negotiate a peaceful settlement, but when he failed, he blamed the war fever on the Republican platform or the Republican philosophy of meddling in areas outside their constitutional authority. General William Tecumseh Sherman, in a speech to Congress, clarified the magnitude of the Northern War when he stated that the Union Army had three million men in the field and that half of them were fighting against the loyal states. This turmoil erupted in July 1863 into a bloody battle between New York citizens alongside the state militia versus the federal government's regular forces. History books call it the draft riot, as if it were a spontaneous outburst against conscription. The term disguises the magnitude of this well-planned defiance against Lincoln's brutal policies against the North. The riot was actually a brilliant military defense of the Empire State against the invasion of its sovereignty. It was the Battle of New York City. It was the longest engagement of the entire war and the only major urban battle. It surpassed Gettysburg in length of time, geographic scale, and approached it in casualty numbers. It more resembled the house-to-house -house fighting at Stalingrad or Berlin in the Second World War. As a result of New York's insurgency, Lincoln inflicted a harsh occupation program on it while the war raged in the South. This contradicts the myth that Abraham Lincoln was a moderate who opposed the radical Republican plan to impose a reconstruction of vendetta upon the defeated Confederacy. This myth presupposes that had Lincoln lived, the seceded states would have returned to the Union painlessly. Yet Lincoln imposed a tyrannical military dictatorship over New York in the midst of the war, and it remained into peacetime. This paralleled the treatment for the post-war South with Boss Tweed's carpetbag style regime and its incredible corruption and frenzied spending, the changes and the proposed changes in New York's constitution, like those alterations in the, con in the conquered states designed to centralize power in the Republican assembly. Long after the bloodshed ceased, there were still military trials in New York for New York civilians coinciding with that kind of false justice in the South. Clement Vallandigham was a congressman from Ohio and a nationally prominent Democrat. In May 1863, he made a speech attacking the Lincoln administration's conduct in the war. He was arrested, convicted by a military tribunal, although a civilian, and deported into the Confederacy. Vallandigham provoked this extreme reaction by assailing Lincoln's autocratic power, calling it, quote, as inexorable in its character as that of the worst despotism of the old world of ancient or modern times. When an attempt is made to deprive us of, free, of a free press and free speech, the hour shall then have come when it will be the duty of freemen to find some other efficient mode of redress." Unquote. Governor Seymour said this about the Landingham's arrest, quote, if this proceeding is approved by the government and sanctioned by the people, it is not merely a step toward despotism, it establishes military despotism. Then John Mullaly, a prominent Democrat in New York, gave this call to arms, quote, 
While we have such a governor as Horatio Seymour, there is not a man that needs to be afraid of being carried off as Vallandigham has been. New York is a state out of which Vallandigham could not have been taken except over the bodies of thousands of armed citizens. Unconstitutional arrests, attacks on freedom of speech, confiscation, etc., put the citizens of New York on a collision course with Lincoln. But the spark that provoked war between the state and federal governments was the assault on state sovereignty. This was manifested by the radical transition from permitting each state to administer the bringing of men into the military system within its jurisdiction to the nationalizing of, of conscription. In March 1863, with the war going badly, voluntary enlistments dropped dramatically. 